the doll's ghost by francis marion crawford it was a terrible accident and for one moment the splendid machinery of cranston house got out of gear and stood still the butler emerged from the retirement in which he spent his elegant leisure two grooms of the chambers appeared simultaneously from opposite directions there were actually housemaids on the grand staircase and those who remember the facts most exactly assert that mrs pringle herself positively stood upon the landing mrs pringle was the housekeeper as for the head nurse the under nurse and the nursery maid their feelings cannot be described the head nurse laid one hand upon the polished marble balustrade and stared stupidly before her the under nurse stood rigid and pale leaning against the polished marble wall and the nursery maid collapsed and sat down upon the polished marble step just beyond the limits of the velvet carpet and frankly burst into tears the lady gwendolen lancaster douglas scroop youngest daughter of the ninth duke of cranston and aged six years and three months picked herself up quite alone and sat down on the third step from the foot of the grand staircase in cranston house oh ejaculated the butler and he disappeared again ah responded the grooms of the chamber and they also went away it's only that doll mrs pringle was distinctly heard to say in a tone of contempt the under-nurse heard her say it. Then the three nurses gathered round Lady Gwendolen and patted her and gave her unhealthy things out of their pockets and hurried her out of Cranston House as fast as they could, lest it should be found out upstairs that they had allowed the Lady Gwendolen Lancaster Douglas Scroop to tumble down the grand staircase with her doll in her arms. And as the doll was badly broken, the nursery maid carried it with the pieces wrapped up in Lady Gwendolen's little cloak. It was not far from Hyde Park, and when they had reached a quiet place, they took means to find out that Lady Gwendolen had no bruises, for the carpet was very thick and soft, and there was thick stuff under it to make it softer. Lady Gwendolen Douglas Scroop sometimes yelled, but she never cried. It was because she had yelled that the nurse had allowed her to go downstairs alone with Nina, the doll, under one arm, while she steadied herself with her other hand on the balustrade and trod upon the polished marble steps beyond the edge of the carpet. So she had fallen, and Nina had come to grief. When the nurses were quite sure that she was not hurt, they unwrapped the doll and looked at her in her turn. She had been a very beautiful doll very large and fair and healthy, with real yellow hair and eyelids that would open and shut over very grown-up dark eyes. Moreover, when you moved her right arm up and down, she said, Papa, and when you moved the left, she said, Mama, very distinctly. I heard her say, Pa, when she fell, said the under-nurse, who heard everything. But she ought to have said, Papa, that's because her arm went up when she hit the step said the head nurse she'll say the other pa when you put it down again pa said nina as her right arm was pushed down and speaking through her broken face it was cracked right across from the upper corner of the forehead with a hideous gash through the nose and down to the little frilled collar of the pale green silk mother hubbard frock and two little three-cornered pieces of porcelain had fallen out i'm sure it's a wonder she can speak at all being all smashed said the under nurse you'll have to take her to mr puckler said her superior it's not far and you'd better go at once lady gwendolen was occupied in digging a hole in the ground with a little spade and paid no attention to the nurses what are you doing inquired the nursery maid looking on nina's dead and i'm digging her a grave replied her ladyship thoughtfully oh she'll come to life again all right said the nursery maid the under nurse wrapped nina up again and departed fortunately a kind soldier with very long legs and a very small cap happened to be there and as he had nothing to do he offered to see the under nurse safely to mr puckler's and back mr bernard puckler and his little daughter lived in a little house in a little alley which led out off a quiet little street not very far from belgrave square he was the great doll doctor and his extensive practice lay in the most aristocratic 
quarter he mended dolls of all sizes and ages boy dolls and girl dolls baby dolls in long clothes and grown-up dolls in fashionable gowns talking dolls and dumb dolls those that shut their eyes when they lay down and those whose eyes had to be shut for them by means of a mysterious wire his daughter elsa was only just over twelve years old but she was already very clever at mending dolls clothes and at doing their hair which is harder than you might think though the dolls sit quite still while it is being done mr puckler had originally been a german but he had dissolved his nationality in the ocean of london many years ago like a great many foreigners he still had one or two german friends however who came on saturday evenings and smoked with him and played piquet or scat with him for farthing points and called him herr doctor which seemed to please mr puckler very much he looked older than he was for his beard was rather long and ragged his hair was grizzled and thin and he wore horn-rimmed spectacles as for elsa she was a thin pale child very quiet and neat with dark eyes and brown hair that was plaited down her back and tied with a bit of black ribbon she mended the dolls clothes and took the dolls back to their homes when they were quite strong again the house was a little one but too big for the two people who lived in it there was a small sitting-room on the street and the workshop was at the back and there were three rooms upstairs but the father and daughter lived most of their time in the workshop because they were generally at work even in the evenings mr puckler laid nina on the table and looked at her a long time till the tears began to fill his eyes behind the horn-rimmed spectacles he was a very susceptible man and he often fell in love with the dolls he mended and found it hard to part with them when they had smiled at him for a few days they were real little people to him with characters and thoughts and feelings of their own and he was very tender with them all but some attracted him especially from the first and when they were brought to him maimed and injured their state seemed so pitiful to him that the tears came easily you must remember that he lived among dolls during a great part of his life and understood them how do you know they feel nothing he went on to say to elsa you must be gentle with them it costs nothing to be kind to the little beings and perhaps it makes a difference to them and elsa understood him because she was a child and she knew that she was more to him than all the dolls he fell in love with nina at first sight perhaps because her beautiful brown glass eyes were something like elsa's own and he loved elsa first and best with all his heart and besides it was a very sorrowful case nina had evidently not been long in the world for her complexion was perfect her hair was smooth where it should be smooth and curly where it should be curly and her silk clothes were perfectly new but across her face was that frightful gash like a sabre cut deep and shadowy within but clean and sharp on the edges when he tenderly pressed her head to close the gaping wound the edges made a fine grating sound that was painful to hear and the lids of the dark eyes quivered and trembled as though nina were suffering dreadfully poor nina he exclaimed sorrowfully but i shall not hurt you much though you will take a long time to get strong he always asked the names of the broken dolls when they were brought to him and sometimes the people knew what the children called them and told him he liked nina for a name altogether and in every way she pleased him more than any doll he had seen for many years and he felt drawn to her and made up his mind to make her perfectly strong and sound no matter how much labor it might cost him mr puckler worked patiently a little at a time and elsa watched him she could do nothing for poor nina whose clothes needed no mending the longer the doll doctor worked the more fond he became of the yellow hair and the beautiful brown glass eyes he sometimes forgot all the other dolls that were waiting to be mended lying side by side on a shelf and sat for an hour gazing at nina's face while he racked his ingenuity for some new invention by which to hide even the smallest trace of the terrible accident 
she was wonderfully mended even he was obliged to admit that but the scar was still visible to his keen eyes a very fine line right across the face downwards from right to left yet all the conditions had been most favourable for a cure since the cement had set quite hard at the first attempt and the weather had been fine and dry which makes a great difference in a doll's hospital at last he knew that he could do no more and the under nurse had already come twice to see whether the job was finished as she crossly expressed it nina is not quite strong yet mr puckler had answered each time for he could not make up his mind to face the parting and now he sat before the square deal table at which he worked and nina laid before him for the last time with a big brown paper box beside her it stood there like her coffin waiting for her he thought he must put her into it and lay tissue paper over her dear face and then put on the lid and at the thought of tying the string his sight was dim with tears again he was never to look into the glassy depths of the beautiful brown eyes any more nor to hear the little wooden voice saying papa and mamma it was a very painful moment in the vain hope of gaining time before the separation he took up the little sticky bottles of cement and glue and gum and colour looking at each one in turn and then at nina's face and all his small tools lay there neatly arranged in a row but he knew that he could not use them again for nina she was quite strong at last and in a country where there should be no cruel children to hurt her she might live a hundred years with only that almost imperceptible line across her face to tell of the fearful thing that had befallen her on the marble steps of cranston house suddenly mr puckler's heart was quite full and he rose abruptly from his seat and turned away elsa he said unsteadily you must do it for me i cannot bear to see her go into the box so he went and stood at the window with his back turned while elsa did what he had not the heart to do is it done he asked not turning around then take her away my dear put on your hat and take her to cranston house quickly and when you are gone i will turn around Elsa was used to her father's queer ways with the dolls, and though she had never seen him so much moved by a parting, she was not much surprised. "'Come back quickly,' he said, when he heard her hand on the latch. "'It is growing late, and I should not send you at this hour, but I cannot bear to look forward to it any more.' When Elsa was gone, he left the window and sat down in his place before the table again to wait for the child to come back. He touched the place where Nina had lain, very gently, and he recalled the softly tinted pink face, and the glass eyes, and the ringlets of her yellow hair, till he could almost see them. The evenings were long, for it was late in the spring, but it began to grow dark soon, and Mr. Puckler wondered why Elsa did not come back. She had been gone an hour and a half, and that was much longer than he had expected, for it was barely half a mile from Belgrave Square to Cranston House. He reflected that the child might have been kept waiting, but as the twilight deepened, he grew anxious, and walked up and down in the dim workshop, no longer thinking of Nina, but of Elsa, his own living child whom he loved an undefinable disquieting sensation came upon him by fine degrees a chilliness and a faint stirring of his thin hair joined with a wish to be in any company rather than to be alone much longer it was the beginning of fear he told himself in strong german english that he was a foolish old man and he began to feel about for the matches in the dusk he knew just where they should be for he always kept them in the same place close to the little tin box that held bits of sealing wax of various colours for some kinds of mending but somehow he could not find the matches in the gloom something had happened to elsa he was sure and as his fear increased he felt as though it might be allayed if he could get a light and see what time it was then he called himself a foolish old man again and the sound of his own voice startled him in the dark he could not find the matches the window was grey still he might see what time it was if he went close to it 
and he could go and get the matches out of the cupboard afterwards he stood back from the table to get out of the way of the chair and began to cross the board floor something was following him in the dark hmm. there was a small pattering as of tiny feet upon the boards he stopped and listened and the roots of his hair tingled it was nothing he was a foolish old man he made two steps more and he was sure that he heard the little pattering again he turned his back to the window leaning against the sash so that the panes began to crack and he faced the dark everything was quite still and it smelt of paste and cement and wood filings as usual is that you elsa he asked and he was surprised by the fear in his voice there was no answer in the room and he held up his watch and tried to make out what time it was by the gray dusk that was just not darkness as far as he could see it was within two or three minutes of ten o'clock he had been a long time alone he was shocked and frightened for elsa out in london so late and he almost ran across the room to the door as he fumbled for the latch he distinctly heard the running of little feet after him mice he exclaimed feebly just as he got the door open he shut it quickly behind him and felt as though some cold thing had settled on his back and were writhing upon him the passage was quite dark but he found his hat and was out in the alley in a moment breathing more freely and surprised to find how much light there still was in the open air he could see the pavement clearly under his feet and far off in the street to which the alley led he could hear the laughter and calls of children playing some game out of doors he wondered how he could have been so nervous and for an instant he thought of going back into the house to wait quietly for elsa but instantly he felt that nervous fright of something stealing over him again in any case it was better to walk up to cranston house and ask the servants about the child one of the women had perhaps taken a fancy to her and was even now giving her tea and cake he walked quickly to belgrave square and then up the broad streets listening as he went whenever there was no other sound for the tiny footsteps but he heard nothing and was laughing at himself when he rang the servants bell at the big house of course the child must be there the person who opened the door was quite an inferior person for it was a back door but affected the manners of the front and stared at mr puckler superciliously under the strong light no little girl had been seen and he knew nothing about no dolls she is my little girl said mr puckler tremulously for all his anxiety was returning tenfold and i am afraid something has happened the inferior person said rudely that nothing could have happened to her in that house because she had not been there which was a jolly good reason why and mr puckler was obliged to admit that the man ought to know as it was his business to keep the door and let people in he wished to be allowed to speak to the under nurse who knew him but the man was ruder than ever and finally shut the door in his face when the doll doctor was alone in the street he steadied himself by the railing for he felt as though he were breaking in two just as some dolls break in the middle of the backbone presently he knew that he must be doing something to find elsa and that gave him strength he began to walk as quickly as he could through the streets following every highway and byway which his little girl might have taken on her errand he also asked several policemen in vain if they had seen her and most of them answered him kindly for they saw that he was a sober man and in his right senses and some of them had little girls of their own it was one o'clock in the morning when he went up to his own door again worn out and hopeless and broken-hearted as he turned the key in the lock his heart stood still for he knew that he was awake and not dreaming and that he really heard those tiny footsteps pattering to meet him inside the house along the passage but he was too unhappy to be much frightened any more and his heart went on again with a dull regular pain that found its way all through him with every pulse so he went in and hung up his hat in the dark and found the matches in the cupboard and the candlestick in its place in the corner 
mr puckler was so much overcome and so completely worn out that he sat down in his chair before the work-table and almost fainted as his face dropped forward upon his folded hands beside him the solitary candle burned steadily with a low flame in the still warm air elsa elsa he moaned against his yellow knuckles and that was all he could say and it was no relief to him on the contrary the very sound of the name was a new and sharp pain that pierced his ears and his head and his very soul for every time he repeated the name it meant that little elsa was dead somewhere out in the streets of london in the dark he was so terribly hurt that he did not even feel something pulling gently at the skirt of his old coat so gently that it was like the nibbling of a tiny mouse he might have thought that it was really a mouse if he had noticed it elsa elsa he groaned right against his hands then a cool breath stirred his thin hair and the low flame of the one candle dropped down almost to a mere spark not flickering as though a draught were going to blow it out but just dropping down as if it were tired out mr puckler felt his hand stiffening with fright under his face and there was a faint rustling sound like some small silk thing blown in a gentle breeze he sat up straight stark and scared and a small wooden voice spoke in the stillness ba ba it said with a break between the syllables mr puckler stood up in a single jump and his chair fell over backwards with a smashing noise upon the wooden floor the candle had almost gone out it was nina's doll voice that had spoken and he should have known it among the voices of a hundred other dolls and yet there was something more in it a little human ring with a pitiful cry and a call for help and the wail of a hurt child mr puckler stood up stark and stiff and tried to look around but at first he could not for he seemed to be frozen from head to foot then he made a great effort and he raised one hand to each of his temples and pressed his own head round as he would have turned a doll's the candle was burning so low that it might as well have been out altogether for any light it gave and the room seemed quite dark at first then he saw something he would not have believed that he could be more frightened than he had been just before that but he was and his knees shook for he saw the doll standing in the middle of the floor shining with a faint and ghostly radiance her beautiful glassy brown eyes fixed on his and across her face the very thin line of the break he had mended shone as though it were drawn in light with a fine point of white flame yet there was something more in the eyes too there was something human like elsa's own but as if only the doll saw him through them and not elsa and there was enough of elsa to bring back all his pain and to make him forget his fear elsa my little elsa he cried aloud the small ghost moved and its doll arm slowly rose and fell with a stiff mechanical motion ba ba it said it seemed this time that there was even more of elsa's tone echoing somewhere between the wooden notes that reached his ears so distinctly and yet so far away elsa was calling him he was sure his face was perfectly white in the gloom but his knees did not shake any more and he felt that he was less frightened yes child but where where he asked where are you elsa ba ba the syllables died away in the quiet room there was a low rustling of silk the glassy brown eyes turned slowly away and mr puckler heard the pitter-patter of the small feet in the bronze kid slippers as the figure ran straight to the door then the candle burned high again the room was full of light and he was alone mr puckler passed his hand over his eyes and looked about him he could see everything quite clearly and he felt that he must have been dreaming though he was standing instead of sitting down as he should have been if he had just waked up the candle burned brightly now there were the dolls to be mended lying in a row with their toes up the third one had lost her right shoe and elsa was making one he knew that and he was certainly not dreaming now 
he had not been dreaming when he had come in from his fruitless search and had heard the doll's footsteps running to the door he had not fallen asleep in the chair how could he possibly have fallen asleep when his heart was breaking he had been awake all the time he steadied himself set the fallen chair upon its legs and said to himself again very emphatically that he was a foolish old man he ought to be out in the streets looking for his child asking questions and inquiring at the police stations where all accidents were reported as soon as they were known or at the hospitals papa the longing wailing pitiful little wooden cry rang from the passage outside the door and mr puckler stood for an instant with white face transfixed and rooted to the spot a moment later his hand was on the latch then he was in the passage with the light streaming from the open door behind him quite at the other end he saw the little phantom shining clearly in the shadow and the right hand seemed to beckon to him as the arm rose and fell once more he knew all at once that it had not come to frighten him but to lead him and when it disappeared and he walked boldly towards the door he knew that it was in the street outside waiting for him he forgot that he was tired and had eaten no supper and had walked many miles for a sudden hope ran through and through him like a golden stream of life and sure enough at the corner of the alley and at the corner of the street and out in belgrave square he saw the small ghost flitting before him sometimes it was only a shadow where there was other light but then the glare of the lamps made a pale green sheen on its little mother hubbard frock of silk and sometimes when the streets were dark and silent the whole figure shone out brightly with its yellow curls and rosy neck it seemed to trot along like a tiny child and mr puckler could almost hear the pattering of the bronze kid's slippers on the pavement as it ran but it went very fast and he could only just keep up with it tearing along with his hat on the back of his head and his thin hair blown by the night breeze and his horn-rimmed spectacles firmly set upon his broad nose on and on he went and he had no idea where he was he did not even care for he knew certainly that he was going the right way then at last in a wide quiet street he was standing before a big sober-looking door that had two lamps on each side of it and a polished brass bell handle which he pulled and just inside when the door was opened in the bright light there was a little shadow and the pale green sheen of the little silk dress and once more the small cry came to his ears less pitiful more longing papa the shadow turned suddenly bright and out of the brightness the beautiful brown glass eyes were turned up happily to his while the rosy mouth smiled so divinely that the phantom doll looked almost like a little angel just then a little girl was brought in soon after ten o'clock said the quiet voice of the hospital doorkeeper i think they thought she was only stunned she was holding a big brown paper box against her and they could not get it out of her arms she had a long plait of brown hair that hung down as they carried her she is my little girl said mr puckler but he hardly heard his own voice he leaned over elsa's face in the gentle light of the children's ward and when he had stood there a minute the beautiful brown eyes opened and looked up to his papa cried elsa softly i knew you would come then mr puckler did not know what he did or said for a moment and what he felt was worth all the fear and terror and despair that had almost killed him that night but by and by elsa was telling her story and the nurse let her speak for there were only two other children in the room who were getting well and were sound asleep they were big boys with bad faces said elsa and they tried to get nina away from me but i held on and fought as well as i could till one of them hit me with something and i don't remember any more for i tumbled down and i suppose the boys ran away and somebody found me there but i'm afraid nina is all smashed here is the box said the nurse we could not take it out of her arms till she came to herself should you like to see if the doll is broken and she undid the string cleverly but nina was all smashed to pieces 
only the gentle light of the children's ward made a pale green sheen in the folds of the little mother hubbard frock end of the doll's ghost by francis marion crawford